I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to all of you today. Um, I was invited to chat about uh, the Open Textbook Project out of BC Campus, um, and I'm really pleased to do that. My name is Amanda Coolidge. I am Senior Manager of Open Education at BC Campus, and in that role I work with faculty and uh, institutions across our province of British Columbia to advocate for and work with them on the developments adaptation and adoption of open educational practices and in particular open textbooks. Um, if you have questions as we go through this presentation you're welcome to put them in the chat and I'll pause at certain points that um, seem appropriate for me to actually uh, pause and answer those questions. So the first thing is um, I'll be sending these slides out uh, afterwards, and just so you know, all of the work here is uh, CC licensed um, using the CC BY attribution license. So you're able to use this presentation as you need to. So I wanted to give a little bit of background on BC campus itself. And so to give some clarification, we're um, actually based in two different locations. We have an office in Victoria, British Columbia, and we have another office in Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, I'm based in Victoria, and uh, that's where most of our open education team is. So BC Campus supports the work of the BC post-secondary system in the areas of teaching, learning, and educational technology. And what this involves is the coordination of collaborative projects that span multiple institutions across our province. And so we're, we tend to introduce and support innovations about the way in which people learn. Uh, we help institutions evaluate and develop good practice in the use of technology for learning. And we also provide technologies that enable students to apply to and transfer between institutions. We are a publicly funded organization, um, and we also add to our repertoire um, not only teaching, learning, and educational technology, but also open education. So to give you a bit of background in terms of what are the projects that sort of demonstrate our focus. I thought I'd outline a few that are kind of key and fundamental to the work that we do. The first is to manage the BC Open Textbook Project, and we do that on behalf of the Government of British Columbia. I'll get into more details about the project itself as we go through the presentation. Um, we also coordinate the Applied Business Technology Collaborative Program. Um, and we develop and deliver professional learning opportunities. So <clears throat> we work with um, different institutions to put on targeted workshops and events. We do the Open Textbook Summit. We have a facilitating learning online, um, development online, and a symposium for scholarly inquiry into teaching and learning practice. We also foster institutional interinstitutional collaboration. We do that through um, what we've done is established a very active community called the Educational Technology Users Group. Um, we have the British Columbia Teaching and Learning Council, and we have the Teaching and Learning Network. So we've got quite a fair amount of different projects on the go that kind of all relate within each other in that sense of professional development and collaborative projects. So the BC Open Textbook Project itself is housed in the area called Open Education and Professional Learning. Our primary goal is to promote and support the development of OER um, and to ensure that there are system-wide initiatives available to enhance teaching and learning culture through open resources. Um, we have a couple of different uh, avenues to do this. We have a repository called Solar, um, where we house all of our open textbooks as well as any other resources that are open. Uh, we have an online community called Scope, and we have um, the Educational Technology Users Group that's also part of this um, group. So to give you some background, because I think a lot of people sort of assume that the BC Open Textbook Project that I'll tell you about its history, you know, we were founded in 2012 as the project, but our interest and in sort of the um, work we have done in open education really started in 2003. 
So we've been doing this for quite a long time. Um, the government of British Columbia invested uh, roughly $9 million in what we call the Online Program Development Fund. There were 153 grants awarded. Um, there, out of that came 355 open courses, 12 workshops, 19 websites, 396 course components. And so this open development has really sort of been um, very much ingrained in the work that not only the province does, but within the post-secondary institutions. And so we're really proud of that. And that sort of is what has led us to the next phase of our project, which is the Open Textbook Project. And so I want to talk a little bit about why the BC government is so um, interested and most importantly, um, making a difference in changing the trajectory of BC education in the province. And the main reason is because they, like many others, have identified a serious problem that we're seeing. The first is we know that higher education is important, and we also know that, sorry, higher education is expensive. And there's obviously some cost factors that are associated with this. And very much like the US, Canada sees the same issues, which are high tuition and fees, students have to pay for room and board if they're not living at home or have another way of supporting themselves, transportation costs, and then of course there's the books and supplies. And the area that is of great interest to open education and as well as to uh, the province of British Columbia is this area of books and supplies. And so in 2012, um, the Higher Education Strategy Association, which is a Canadian uh, group, they looked at how much students in Canada said that they spent on their textbooks per term. And these numbers um, will probably be fairly similar to what you're seeing. Um, see that 39% is spending between $400 to $600 on their textbooks. Um, however, we see something like 5% are only are spending $800 or more. And so that's not a huge amount to be spending so much on their textbooks, which as you'll see later, leads us to believe that perhaps that means that students aren't actually purchasing or using the textbooks in their course because most of the textbooks would exceed that amount um, of $800 per term. And so what, what happened here and what the problem really is, is that student debt in Canada is rising. This has been an issue that um, is very well known within the United States. And this example came out of our CBC News in 2014, which showed that this one particular student who uh, graduated in 2008, she had $25,000 of debt, um, which at that time was the national average. And after five years of working, um, she actually could only pay back $2,000. And so what this leads us to say is that, you know, this is a huge financial stress on students, but it's not just financial. And what the people have been looking at is that it does take a huge amount of toll on individuals or couples um, as they wish to reach certain milestones in their life. So owning property, um, perhaps getting married is delayed, maybe having children, perhaps going on to a another degree. Um, and so this debt is really crippling um, students and we're seeing that quite a bit in Canada as well. So the other thing is there are actual pedagogical implications to this high textbook cost. Currently there's five major publishers that hold nearly 90 percent of the market, which means that less than one-third of the students um, actually said that they were using e-textbooks sorry, that using e-textbooks significantly improved their learning or engagement in a course. And so when we see, go back to uh, five major publishers hold nearly 90% of the market, what we're talking about here is a group of um, publishers who are making the choice for students, right? We're not, we're seeing this as a huge market failure. And so what we know is that students are captives and they're not consumers in this case. It's not students who are making the choice of which textbook to use, but rather the faculty member is choosing a textbook based on a, perhaps a publisher relationship or perhaps 
there's more ancillary resources in that particular book, or perhaps it's determined by their department which book they'll be using. And so what we see is that from a study from the student interest group out of the United States, that two and three students say that they decided against buying a textbook because the cost is too high. And one in two students say that they have at some point taken fewer courses due to the cost of textbooks. And so what does this tell us? It means that students don't actually learn from the materials they can't afford. And this also further heightens this, this um, which you may have seen before from the Florida Virtual Campus uh, Survey, which, sorry, I keep hitting the forward button, um, is this is sort of heightening that uh, those stats that I was talking about earlier. So 31% choose not to register for a course due to books, book cost. 14% have dropped out of a course. 10% have withdrawn from a course due to book cost. And although these numbers are uh, US centric and probably much more relatable to you, they also are uh, very in line with what we're seeing in Canada. And so as a result, we know that we can do better. And we can do better through open educational resources. So the Hewlett Foundation defines open OER as teaching, learning, and research resources that reside in the public domain or are released under an intellectual property license that permits their free use and repurposing by others. And for us at BC Campus, although we have already had the um, experience with a number of OER projects in the past, we still weren't gaining that traction that was really needed to sort of see a widespread adoption and a widespread decrease in the student debt and student cost of services. And so that's why we went towards textbooks. Um, textbook is basically the um, what students, or sorry, what faculty understand. They know what a textbook is. Um, and so by, by starting off in that area, instead of sort of starting off with how to transform teaching and learning through open educational practices, we decided to go with something a bit more tangible and what was already known to the audience and really talk to faculty, faculty about the main resource that they're using in the classroom and how best to reduce that cost. It's in the forms section of the archives. Yeah. Oh. Hi, can you mute your mic? Sorry, I just heard that forum section of the archive. Um, so, what I wanted, to, so a textbook license under an, sorry, can, whoever has their mic uh, on, can you guys mute it? I'm getting feedback. Thank you. Great. Oh, still getting feedback. It looks like I'm just looking at the participants. Rebecca and Sean, do you have any? Hello? Great. OK, so a textbook is licensed um, under an open, so what we, sorry, what we mean by open textbooks is that it's licensed under an open copyright license. And so it's made available uh, for free online or as an electronic version or as a low-cost printed version. And they can be free, freely used by students, teachers, and any members of the public. And so with all of these open educational resources, one of the concerns that often comes up is quality. And one of the um, latest studies that's come out is shows that, um, that, sorry, highlights the proven quality and efficacy of open educational resources. And so this particular study looked at across 11 academic studies that attempted to measure results pertaining to student learning with approximately 50,000 students and who were participating in 11 studies found that 93% of those students experienced the same or had better outcomes when using or were assigned open educational resources such as open textbooks. And this is really important because a lot of times when we as open educational advocates go to speak to faculty, often their first concern is the quality. And so to be able to showcase a lot of these studies has been um, very valuable. And then 
In terms of student and teacher perceptions of OER, um, there were nine peer-reviewed studies done that were looked, sorry, were looked at and that showed that of 4,500 professors and students that um, approximately 22,366 students and 2,144 faculty members who were surveyed found that they believed that the open educational resources uh, were either 50% of the time as good as traditional resources or 35% superior, and in some cases found that 15% were inferior. So when we talk to faculty about open textbooks, there are benefits that we like to highlight, and these are benefits about why we've gone forward and really invested quite a bit of time and energy into an open textbook project. So first and foremost, faculty benefits, they increased flexibility on how one can use the content, and if there's ancillaries that support that, even better. It's easy to access in a variety of formats, um, no book orders or publishers to deal with, no heavy bulky text to tote, and student feedback has been positive. Students are extremely grateful. We had one instructor um, who actually said that his sociology class, who was using Intro to Sociology uh, open textbook, hand wrote um, individual thank you notes to our Minister of Advanced Education, thanking him for uh, putting forward the funding uh, for open textbooks. So that's really great. And then, of course, it's a social justice issue. So the belief that you know, public funding um, should be used and uh, accessible to the public. So um, the other area that we look at is student benefits, which obviously are outweighing a lot, which is low cost or free, increased availability, the opportunity to retain the books. So no longer do you have to actually um, lose your right to access those materials in an e-version, for example. You don't lose a publisher um, access at the end of your, your term of using that book. <clears throat> One of the things that's really important is that with an open textbook um, or an open educational resource, the student can actually access that book um, prior to the course start. So if, for example, you let folks know early on, perhaps a semester before, if, a, if you're going to be using that particular book, for students that need extra time or perhaps um, need to just um, want to review the, the course content ahead of time, then they can do that. And so that's a really great positive as well. So open means that faculty have the right to customize the textbook and students have day one access to that customized textbook and they also have a choice in how they want to access that book. And I'll go into more detail about that in a bit. And ca they can do this because of the Creative Commons licenses that are attributed to those books. And so many of you are probably familiar with a lot of these licenses and because of those licenses one can make and own a copy, they can use it in a wide range of ways, adapt or modify, combine, and share. Um, and so that's really a lot of the benefits of why open um, textbooks and open educational resources are um, really what I would say is simple and obvious. And so um, as my mom has said before to, as my number one advocate, she always says, it just seems like a no-brainer. And so she's right, it does seem like that. And why wouldn't we be trying to reduce student cost and increasing their uh, learning as well as transforming teaching and learning practices? So one of the things um, that I was also asked to do here is to really go into the detail of how we establish the BC Open Textbook Project and what that looked like. So <clears throat> as I mentioned, we at BC campus been involved with open practice and open educational projects since 2003, but we hadn't really seen or taken account of the significant um, cost savings to students. We hadn't seen really system-wide commitment to open. It sort of had been pockets within institutions that had interest in this. And so when the BC Open Textbook Project was proposed to our government, the idea was that we wanted to transform teaching and learning, we wanted to change um, or 
sorry, change the way in which students were accessing materials, and we wanted to open up their education system so that there was reduced cost on their um, educational career. And so textbooks from the BC government as well as BC campus seem like a great place to start. As I said before in this presentation, faculty know what a textbook is, students know what a textbook is, and to apply an open license to those books means that we can increase access to education through that. So in 2012, the then Minister of Advanced Education announced that the government of British Columbia would put forward $1 million to create 40 open textbooks for the highest enrolled first and second year post-secondary subjects in BC. And so what we did was take a look at what those um, highest enrolled first and second year post-secondary subjects were, and um, we started to collect and put those books in. And then in 2014, the minister, another minister, put forward another million dollars to do 20 open textbooks in skills and trades training, um, which is really important um, to BC to increase our jobs plan and to um, also make an impact in our trades and community college, community college systems in our province. And so the government has put forward $2 million in this project. Um, as a result, we have also signed a memorandum of understanding with Alberta and Saskatchewan, um, two other provinces that are also starting their own open projects. We've been working with Manitoba um, and Alberta to um, what they've done is taken our collection, which I'll show you later, um, and they've mirrored our collection so that they can start doing reviews of open textbooks across Manitoba and Alberta. And we most recently, in the last six months, have formed what we call the Canada OER Group, which is a group of five different or five provinces across Canada who are involved in different open education initiatives um, and the purpose of that group is to ensure that we don't reinvent the wheel in the work that we're doing and utilize the power of open by sharing and um, using the expertise from across Canada so that we can ensure more of a national front on access to education. And so as I mentioned before, we're really committed to doing this project because we want to increase access to higher education by reducing student costs. We want to give faculty more control over their instructional resources, and we want to improve learning outcomes for students. And so when we started the project, <clears throat> we actually didn't start by doing creations of open textbooks, and we didn't start by doing adaptations. What we decided to do was look at the existing open textbook infrastructures that were in place and bring those books into our collection. So we took a look at OpenStax, we looked at OER Commons, Open Textbook Library, Merlot, and a few other projects. And we started bringing books into our collection that we knew adhered or were aligned with those top 40 subject areas in first and second year courses. And from there, we then asked our faculty across the province to do some faculty reviews. And so um, faculty were to review a book on its comprehensiveness, content accuracy, relevancy, clarity, consistency, and modularity. And each review was then posted with the open textbook in the collection. So as you can see, these reviews are open because they're posted along with the reviewer's name and which institution he or she is affiliated with. <clears throat> and they also are released with a CC by ND license. Um, and that was added as a condition because we wanted to be sure that the reviews would not be changed. So then what we did was, based on these reviews, we then put out a call for faculty to um, actually adapt the textbook based on those review. We wanted to ensure that whatever was missing or lacking from the textbook in the collection that was then adapted to meet the needs of BC faculty. So it says the reviews indicated that the books were too US-centric or that some of the chapters were not relevant um, for the BC context. And so being able to adapt a textbook to meet the specific learning outcomes 
that's really the power of working in the open. And so faculty had the opportunity to change the book. And so when we put out a call for proposals, we asked faculty to make those changes. And this is one faculty member who made changes to the intro chemistry book um, that was an open textbook. And he adapted this book, and it came out to be what's now termed Introductory Chemistry, the first Canadian edition. So what we also realized is that there were some books that were required for first and second year um, subject areas that did meet the needs of um, being in the top 40 area, um, but there weren't open textbooks available. And so we started doing creations. So three of those creations, um, and we've done many more, were Ethics and Law Enforcement, Canadian history, we've done pre-confederation and post-confederation, and then uh, BC in a global context, which is a uh, regional geography book. <clears throat> and so this is a sample out of our library. Excuse me, you can see on the left-hand side, we have the subject areas listed, um, arts, business, health, recreation, uh, sciences, etc. And the library is available at open.bccampus.ca and users can go in and take a look at any of the books we have in there. Um, you can see there are some that are target flagged as faculty reviewed, some have items that say adopted, um, and so it will give you an opportunity to see which of those books have either been reviewed, adopted, and or have ancillary resources. So. I wanted to let you know that the results so far, and this is what we know between 2012 and 2006, and keep in mind this is um, for British Columbia only, not all of Canada, is that we've seen a student savings of up to $1.8 million. We have over 15,000 students using the open textbooks, 30 institutions in British Columbia adopting the books. Um, we have a known uh, BC faculty of 160 who are adopting, and we've seen 534 sections across the province adopt open textbooks. We currently have 152 open textbooks in our collection, which we're really proud of. And so <clears throat> one of the other things is, as I mentioned before, is we um, at BC Campus are very committed to inter-institutional collaboration and collaboration across the province. And so what we've also done beyond the Open Textbook Project is to really create a community. Um, and we've done that through the development of an open education community um, to create opportunities for collegial collaboration to really create stronger resources. And so a couple of examples, um, we have what we call the BC OER librarians. Um, these are a group of librarians who have come together from different institutions across the province. And they're a working group who um, they've established guides. They have um, different lib guides for open educational resources. They've created um, different uh, posters and materials that are useful for libraries. And again, that can be found on open.bccampus.ca. We've also done a couple of other things. We've done um, what we call sprints. And so when the project first started, one of the ways that we thought would be innovative and interesting and really bring together a di different group of uh, people was to create a, um, create a textbook. And this one in particular is the BC and Global context book um, out of a sprint. And so we got together with five instructors from different institutions in the province and asked them to sit in a room with us for five days and we created an open textbook in that time. And it was really exciting to be a part of that um, process. It was really exciting to see the faculty so engaged and we're really proud of the outcome of that particular one. Another sprint that we've done is uh, we've done a test bank sprint. So as you know, creating test banks can be extremely time consuming. And um, also, too, in, in order to ensure that there would be widespread adoption, we needed to make sure that more than just one faculty was creating 
open uh, test bank questions. And so in two days, 17 psychology faculty got together across six different institutions and developed 850 questions for a, a, the first year of psychology book. And these questions are available for instructors. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, we did another test bank sprint with the culinary arts instructors and we created 1300 questions in two days uh, for culinary arts and so it's a really engaging way to get faculty on board with doing um, creating open resources and really seeing collaborative efforts through that another program we do at BC campus and in the BC open textbook project is faculty fellows and so in 2015 we started with three faculty fellows, um, Jesse Key, Christina Hendricks, and Rajiv uh, Jangiani, and um, they are their role really is to advocate on behalf of open textbooks, to work with faculty to adopt open textbooks, and to um, to really start helping BC campus and our project um, identify what the needs of faculty are in working on these on different projects as related to open. And then this year, 2016-17, we have Rod Lidstone, Gil Green, and Jennifer Kirkey, and they're, um, they've been working on a number of projects for us as well. Another um, collaborative project we worked on was the Accessibility Toolkit. Uh, we worked with that uh, with CAPER BC, which is our, um, which is a great partner. They work with uh, adapting and updating uh, open or sorry educational resources to make them more accessible <clears throat> or make them accessible to students so we worked with them and Camosun College to create the open textbook accessibility toolkit which walks um, instructors librarians educational developers instructional designers through the process of creating accessible open resources so what's next for um, our project? Well, first we are working with Canada as a nation, um, starting to work with five provinces and hope to really branch that out to more. Uh, we've been collaborating on a number of things with them to ensure that we're not duplicating efforts, but rather we're working towards the common goal of, um, of saving students money and improving teaching and learning practices. We have grants out right now for British Columbia faculty and staff for the development of ancillary resources. We have another grant out for open course design, open innovation, and open textbook creation or adaptation, which is called, <coughs> excuse me, an OER grant, and that's also available to BC faculty and staff. We've recently created a universal design community of practice, and we're also working looking at doing something similar with um, what we did with the BC OER librarian group, but this time to work with instructional designers um, across the province to get them to start thinking more about how to develop courses more in the open and how to work with faculty to, to really engage faculty in open educational development process. So, I wanted to conclude by saying thank you very much um, for inviting me and obviously I'm ready for questions and would be happy to um, answer anything I can. So you can either type it into the chat or you can uh, click your mic and talk to me. So Eric says, 
Can you speak for a moment about incentives and promoting buy-in from faculty? Yeah, so there's two big things that come out of um, the um, buy-in for faculty, and that is, um, sorry, I'm getting a lot of questions now. Hold on. <laughs> um, the incentives and, and promoting buy-in, it's really time and money. So that's one of the biggest barriers to actually developing open educational resources is that faculty say, I don't have the time and I don't have the money. And so if there is any way to actually alleviate the time, um, perhaps buying a section release for faculty, which we've done through some funding or perhaps um, taking on a project um, with, so co-partnering with a partner faculty member in that project, that's been really helpful, um, and uh, money. And so with our project, we've been able to administer funding for different projects, which seems to have helped. Um, and another thing is, um, one thing that I really find extremely helpful is to have faculty talking to faculty. So if there is someone in your institution or even outside of your institution who's a faculty member who has been extremely um, uh, pro open and has had a positive experience using OER, then have that faculty person either come to your institution to give a talk or have that person respond uh, directly and engage with another faculty member. We hope that answers your question. I'll just keep going on here and if um, uh, the next question, what were some of the big challenges and how did you respond? Um, some of the big challenges with the Open Textbook Project was really trying to educate faculty and uh, authors on Creative Commons licenses. So sometimes faculty would develop or write an open textbook but put in copyright images. And so there was a lot of uh, sort of back and forth on that. Time on uh, trying to ensure that everything was as openly licensed as possible took, took quite a bit. The project management of a lot of these open textbooks um, was very time consuming under short timelines. So those were the biggest challenges. Um, and then of course there's, you know, we were, for this particular project we were working, we have been working with the willing. So people apply to our project and they're interested in being a part of it. So we haven't had challenges in the sense of trying to engage people in the pro process, but rather um, trying to educate them as they go through the process. And we've done that in a couple of ways. One is we do adoption workshops across the province. So we talk to faculty and staff about Creative Commons licenses. What does it mean? What does it mean to be fully open? What can we do to um, try to, you know, even take some of the PowerPoint presentations that you create in a class and make those Creative Commons licensed? And then we've done um, adaptation workshops to work with faculty about what does it mean to adapt a version of a textbook or a resource. Um, so we do a lot of communication, and I think communication is really the biggest key to alleviate a lot of those challenges. How can we learn, learn more about specific programs you've mentioned, like the sprints? Yeah, so if you're interested in the sprint model, um, you're, please uh, send me an email. I'm going to put my email down here in the chat. Um, and you can uh, give me a, a shout. I'd be happy to go through more specifics about how we did that. That's not a problem at all. Um, are these resources available to be modified? Yes. So we, um, all of our open textbooks uh, have an editable file associated with them in the collection, so you should be able to modify them and download them as you wish. Do you have thoughts about funding OER projects when federal funding isn't available? How to get started? Yeah, um, so one of the things I think is really important is uh, from an institutional level is to start thinking about the way in which if you have extra funding at your institution, perhaps, you know, if there's like a presidential innovation fund or if your library has e extra funding um, that needs to be spent in the year and perhaps that money tends to go towards collections or um, other avenues within the library, is there a way that a small portion of that can actually be funneled into an OER project? And that's something I think is looking not just externally for federal funding, as you said, or national funding, but 
really looking at the opportunity of what can be funded within an institution and what is available and, and, and to really sort of put out a very a strong case as to what would be needed. So oftentimes what's needed is a um, funding request for a course release time for a faculty member to take that time to actually build the resource. And then once, if you can sort of show not only what that cost is, but what the implication of that cost would be. So for example, what the student saving cost would be on that end, um, that's often very impactful. So for example, our course release sections for one term for a faculty member are about $6,500. And what we tend to be able to do is show an institution, if you invest $6,500 by releasing a faculty member for this particular term, they will create this particular open resource that will then save students, and sometimes it's up to $50,000 per section. <clears throat> and so if you're able to showcase that cost funding, that seems to help. Does that, are those questions, did I answer those questions appropriately? Are there further clarifications that you need or have questions about? Um, so the Hewlett Foundation, um, they fund, yes, they do fund individual projects, um, and I'm not um, entirely sure which those, which those are, but I do know they have done um, specific project uh, funding. Uh, that's a good question. When something has been modified, how are previous versions attributed to past authors or creators? So in, um, as long as you attribute to the material, so for example, um, let me see, I think I'm still sharing my screen. I'm just going to show you an example here. Open that. Let me just go to, I'll show you an example of when we did an adaptation, what that looked like for um, what we do in that case. Um, sorry, just be really quick here. Okay, so here's Intro to Sociology, First Canadian Edition. And what we did was we went ahead and did an adaptation based on the... Um, Intro to Sociology OpenStax book. And so when you take a look at what this book looks like and what the attribution statement is, what we did, and we're very diligent about this, is doo -doo -doo, when you see the copyright, it says the copyright is for Rice University, which was the original book. Originally, it was produced by OpenStax on a CC BY license. And um, the, the adaptation, is done by William Little and Ron McGivern, and this these changes or additions are also licensed under CC BY license. What we then did, we went ahead and identified what changes were made to the book. So for someone who's interested in knowing, well, would I want to use the OpenStax book or do I want to use the um, actual Canadian edition, and so that's how that, that changed. And so through the adaptations, it's just important to identify what the original license was, identify what your changes were, and what your changes are then licensed under. Um, I hope that answered your question, John. Um, clarification, the $9 million in funding you mentioned, original investment, that was provincial, so that was British Columbia, yes.
Anybody else? Oh, sure. The URL for Accessibility Toolkit. No problem. Just a second. Here we go. You're welcome, Dana. We are using Pressbooks for our authoring tool, yes. Um, Anne is asking, have you found that faculty like press books? Um, you know, it's a mix and match. Um, they like the ability to easily edit, um, but they do get frustrated at times with the uh, with having to um, not work in like Word, for example, which is more of their traditional use of editing or doing work. But um, on the whole, aside from some minor technical issues, we have found that faculty are pretty amenable to using press books, um, and they've um, you know, they come up with some things that need to be adapted or changed, and so we work with our developer on that. But um, overall, it's been a really great tool um, for for actually um, making these textbooks available. Um, so the question is, across different institutions, how are the bookstores supporting this? Do they offer print copies of the open textbooks? So. What we've done at BC Campus is we put a call out to our institutions about uh, offering a print-on-demand service. And the um, bid that came in to offer that service was from Simon Fraser University's Print Services. And so they, through, if you want to purchase an open textbook through our collection, a BC student or faculty would go through um, they can click on the link that says print this book and they would purchase it through the Simon Fraser print on demand service. The bookstores individually, however, are more than welcome to, um, if they have their own print on demand service, to print these books and distribute them and sell them to their students at their own institution. So that's also uh, an opportunity for bookstores. Um, the other thing too is we've created for a couple of bookstores sort of one-page handouts on questions that may arise from students. So for example, um, a lot of bookstores were coming to us and saying, sometimes I'm the first contact for a student before they actually meet their faculty member, and so what kind of things do they need to know about an open textbook? Because obviously, if just a link is placed in the course syllabus, students might be confused as to where do I buy this book or how do we actually use it. And so bookstores <clears throat> across the province have been really willing to chat about this and if they're able to offer the print versions, they're more than welcome to and we ensure that they're able to do this. Um, do you use an editing service for faculty? Yes, we do. So if a faculty member creates an open textbook um, using B funding we have um, we work with copy editors to ensure quality and consistency if they also if an institution has their own copy editing services we often suggest uh, that they use those um, services so that it maintains consistency within their institution but in order for a book to be posted within our collection it must have been copy edited The sprints, do you have a structure developed prior to faculty begin work or are the faculty self-governed? For example, are there certain chapters or areas that are outlined? Right. So um, with the sprints, we actually, with the, with the geography sprint, for example, which is the only sprint we've done to create an open textbook, the faculty were only to con come with um, considerations of what they might like to see in an open textbook on British Columbia geography. They weren't to do any outline, they weren't to do any chapter creation, um, because the idea was to really create something that was a collaborative effort versus maybe one or two people leading the way. And so the very first morning, what we did was start to brainstorm what those chapters and outlines would look like. People did bring their outlines from other courses, um, and so that helped inform sort of the lay of the land. 
but in a whole that uh, we tend to not like people to do that ahead of time. Um, when it came to the test bank sprints, we did ask faculty to bring test questions that they have used in the past um, so that we were able to get people to vet what those questions would look like. I hope that helps your respond. Um, do you have faculty members who want to mix licensed content into their resources and make their result available in an LMS? Has that been a challenge? <clears throat> yes. Um, what? who want to mix the Creative Commons license, is that what you mean, material? So they want to put, just to clarify, they want to put, see, are you asking if they want to take open resources and put them in their LMS? Journal content. Just getting some. Oh, um, they're allowed, aren't they allowed? So you're saying if they wanted to include articles in their courses where the library has licensed the material and they put it in the in the LMS, that that's fine, isn't it? Isn't that what people do now with courses a lot of times? It hasn't been an issue with our um, with our project, no. Oh, <clears throat> good question. So, if there's a requirement that OER be completely open in the end, so if if with our project, if we fund a project, if they're let's say they're doing an open course redesign. What we expect is that they would give us a copy of that um, course, even if it's created in like Moodle, um, or um, so that we can then have a copy that can be shared out widely to different provinces. However, a faculty is still welcome to put that material in their LMS if they wish and just use it within their LMS as a way of distribution, but should know that there is, that they need to have another extension available for a wider audience. I hope that makes sense. Okay, great. Great, thank you. Great, I'm really glad that this was helpful, that's awesome. <clears throat>